Hi, welcome to this show. Ancient Egyptian stories of corrupted souls. These are based on a number of things. First, we have the 42 entries of the negative confession, part of the weighing of the heart process. We have our Anubis and we have the the heart of the deceased away and the feather of truth in which it's weighed. And at this point, this lucky soul is level and they are gonna be going to the afterlife. But not everybody were good. And these three stories that I'm about to give perform for you are based on a variety of entries from the 42 entries of the negative confession, plus some uh, instructional texts. And the very single lines inspired me to perform these. Mixing sort of ancient Egyptian ideas and social life with a bit of a twist. Think of the wonderful Towers of the Unexpected, which I grew up with in the in the seventies, and recently they've been showing on TV here, so it's really helped. So this first one is based on a line from the Negative Confession called, "Which the deceased confirms that they have not committed witchcraft against the king." And actually, of all, all three, this one's based on facts. It's also known as the Harim con Conspiracy. Not to give the, too much of the story away, I've got a few twists. Pharaoh must have died. Tia leant back in her chair the darkness of her bedchamber obscuring her face as she observed Pebenham, the chief of the harem who sat opposite her. His eyebrows raised. He looked towards the door. Tia was nervous. She clecked, clunked. clenched <laughs> the uh, chair hat. Was he going to alert the guards? This was, after all, treason. But he turned to look at her, or her outline. Go on. I'm listening, he says. Tia lets out an audible sigh. He doesn't see the broad smile on her face. She leans back in to the candlelight. Pharaoh must die. He must die soon. And I'll tell you why. Great Ramesses III, our king, is riding on the tails of his father. The country is in turmoil. We have to see people to the north who are going to invade very soon. We have dissent within our workers, the country needs a new ruler. And yes, while Queen Tai, first wife of Pharaoh, has a son through him, her, and he will sit upon the throne. I think, I firmly believe, in fact, that that Ramesses dynasty must end. 
we need a new dynasty. My son should sit upon the throne instead of Ramesses. I plan to make that happen. And I want you, Pebenham, to help. She raises her hands to stop Pebenham from interrupting. You are chief of the harem. You have freedom of movement across the whole of the palace. I need you to do something for me because Aya will be watched all the time. I need you to go and find others that are sympathetic to my cause. I want you to win them over or find others that will help you. Will you do that for me? There will be great rewards when I am queen. She sinks back onto her chair, obscured by the shadows once again, and observes Pedman's response. He nervously rubs his head and looks to the door. You are right, wife of Ramesses. The sea people are a threat and there is open revolt, strikes, the grain harvest has failed, the country is in a state. What is it you wish me to do? For I feel I we should. I will help you with this. Returning from the shadows, Tia takes a bag that is resting on her lap and opens it. Withdrawing a wax doll dressed as Pharaoh. It is with dolls such as these that I have learnt magic from a wise woman in the town. I saw her while traveling through the market not so long ago and inquired about her. She taught me the magic required to use these dolls to bind and freeze and paralyze all those that are portrayed with it through magic. She stops, Pebenham gasps. Witchcraft against the king, you know, this is treason enough as itself, but this witchcraft, that is an abomination. If we are caught, we face oblivion. Are you absolutely certain this is the only way? Yes. Let me continue, Pebenham. With these dolls in various guises of officials, guards, I wish you to spread them with others. Ask them to take parts of the guards and of other officials that we can control and bind them to these dolls. And through those, we will paralyze the entire court and Pharaoh will be defenseless. Will you help? Pebenham nods. Pebenham finds himself 
in the harem, in a corner, surrounded by the other minor wives of Pharaoh. They hold the various dolls and look nervous, nervously around them and to the door. Heaven and breaks the silence. But will you do this for Tia? Or look to the ground and fiddle with these dolls idly. But one more vocal and more dominant of all those minor wives speaks up. Yes, we will assist Tia on the condition that we guaranteed safety after this incident. That we will have good standing, that we will be safe. But this is bad, should we have be found. Pebenham reassures them. Certainly, certainly, I will see to it personally that you are all accounted for and you are safe. Now take these dolls and spread them amongst the guards and any other official you can find. We don't have long. Many days pass. There is tension in the palace. Queen Tai, first wife of Pharaoh, paces her bedchamber. She has sensed something is wrong within the court. She is nervous and concerned. Suddenly she stops her pacing and looks to the far corner of the chamber, to a chest that lies in darkness, in shadow. She hurries to it, throws the lid open and looks upon the contents. Her eyes widen in alarm as she reaches into the chest and withdraws a broken wax doll of Pharaoh. The head has detached from the body. And so it begins. She carefully places the wax doll back within the chest and closes the lid. Guard, guard here now to your queen. And two guards rush in, swords drawn, ready to attack whatever may be attacking the queen, but find she's alone. You guards, I sense Pharaoh is in trouble, he is at risk. Double the guard and be sure of absolute loyalty. Can I be sure of your loyalty to your queen? And they nod dumbly. Well, go. On the other side of the palace sits Tia and Pebenham. 
within her bedchamber once again. Both are quiet. Both lost in their thoughts. Tia watches Ebenon as he rocks backwards and forwards, rubbing his hands. Tia, Ebenon, suddenly erupts from the silence. Is it time yet? It is, Ebenon. And she pulls from her bag some more wax dolls. Ebenon watches, fascinated, but the three, four dolls of guard, representing guards, held tight in her hand. She pulls a cord from the bag and slowly wraps it around the dolls and then tightens it. It begins now, Pebenum. You go now. Pebenum looks in the direction that she's suddenly looking in. All he sees is shadows, but soon the shadows move. A figure hugs the wall. How long has that person been there, he wonders. They've been discussing things for hours. He's not aware of anybody else being in the room until now. The shadow moves across the wall and through the door into the hallway. Now, Pebenham, she gives out a sigh. We wait. They continue waiting in silence for hours, it feels. Their ears straining for the slightest sound in the hallway. So quiet out there. Peppenham relaxes somewhat, wondering is this actually gonna happen or not? Suddenly, noise, clatter of metal on stone, running feet, shouting. Peppenham stands up and rushes to the door. Careful, Peppermint, Tia says, as she slowly gets up and walks with to meet him at the door. They both step into the hallway, trying to make out in the shadows where these sounds are coming from. Doesn't take long, soon they see movement up ahead. There's a figure running rapidly along the court hallway towards them, swiftly followed by a horde of guards. Tia gasps, Pebenham, Pebenham. That is the assassin we sent. You must stop him. Do something. Do not let the guards get hold of him or we are undone. Go now. And Pebenham withdraws a dagger from his sleeve and conceals it behind him as he steps towards the oncoming assassin hurtling down the corridor. The disheveled man approaches and slows. Pebenham steps forward 
and stabs in the stomach. There was no time for the assassin to respond, and he sinks slowly to the ground, Pevenham holding the dagger in, twisting it, and then withdrawing as he lays the assassin on the ground. See, I have stopped the assassin as the guards approach. They all gather round. And look upon this body on the floor in a growing pool of blood. All is quiet. But there's a shuffle from within the behind the group of guards. Queen T pushes them apart and looks upon the body on the floor and then looks up directly to Pebenham and seeing Tia behind him. That is a curious thing to say. Is that not Pebenham? You assume this was an assassin, do you? Why would you say that? Pebenham realizes his mistake and drops the knife. He steps back. Guards, rest Pebenham and Quintia. The court case and prosecution of all of those that were involved took many, many days and took many, many lives. In the throne room of the palace, Ramesses III, great pharaoh sat upon his throne and Queen T stood at his right hand side. At his feet up in front of him, kneeling, dirty, disheveled, and bruised, Pebenham and Queen Tia. The air is thick with smoke from the funeral pyres from outside. The harem and the palace has been purged for using witchcraft against the king. They are not right. They have no right to official burial and journey to the afterlife. They have committed a deep sin. Therefore, they shall meet oblivion and be burnt at the stake and no body shall be buried. But these two, these two that were the instigators, for they all pointed their fingers very quickly under torture. These two receive the full force of Pharaoh's wrath. The two refused to look up at their Pharaoh. Pebenham, Pharaoh's voice resounds through the court in front of all of the people still left, which aren't many, to be honest. I am sorely disappointed in you. You are a trusted official. You, I cannot say, very disappointed. You were instrumental in this. You will now reach meet the same fate as all those others that have defied me and have gone to harm your Pharaoh. 
you shall be taken out, you shall be castrated, and you will then be burnt alive. Pebnum falls to the floor prostrate, crying, pleading with Pharaoh for forgiveness, for mercy. There won't be any mercy. With a nod from Pharaoh, the guards drag Pebnum away, screaming, screaming and pointing and placing the blame firmly, firmly on Queen Tia. She looks up and stares directly at Pharaoh. He returns that steely gaze. And you, my queen, you have hurt me deeply, for I thought I could trust you. But no, you sought to place your own son on the throne. Bring him in. A guard brings in a small child of only five years old. And Tia grasps this boy to her and hugs him deeply. The child is oblivious to what is happening. For you, Tia, and your son, I'm afraid you shall also meet the same fate as all of these others that have committed this deeper sin against your king and your husband. But you, of being of royal blood, shall be spared the torture and agony of being burnt alive. You will have poison first, and then you shall be burnt. T administer Pharaoh's judgment. Queen T picks up a small vial and descends the steps to stand before Tia prostrate on the floor. She kneel, kneels down and strokes Tia's hair. Tia tries hard to maintain her poise. She will try and show no fear until the end. Tia, T, Queen T offers the vial of poison, but Tia's hand shakes as she approaches to get it. The facade falling and she shakes her head sadly. Queen T accepts this and opens the bottle and pours some into the child's mouth. It is not long before the child, breathing shallow and stops. The body is pale and Queen Tia slowly lowers her son's body to the floor. Tears beginning to form, but she tries her very hardest to remain composed. Queen T places the vial to the lips of Tia and pour some in. T leans in to Tia and whispers in her ear, thank you for doing this. I taught you how to use those dolls very well, didn't I? 
You didn't get I was in disguise as that old woman, wise woman, who taught you the magic of the dolls. But thank you for diverting attention away from me. I too believe Pharaoh should die and my son should be Pharaoh. But I cannot wait for the many years of his natural reign. So tonight, it will be I who cut his throat. And tomorrow, there shall be a new king. But you shall be dead. Queen T looks up at T and gives her final gasp, a tear running down her cheek as Queen T slowly lowers the body of T to the floor. She stands up and returns to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's justice has been served. Long live the king. And she grins at her Pharaoh, at her husband, knowing what the night will bring. Thank you, thank you. Hope everybody enjoyed that. And I forgot some of the other intro too. Woohoo! This is the way it all goes. So hopefully, hope, thank you for everybody here and all of you watching, hopefully online afterwards. I'm down in sunny Dover. It's very sunny. Hopefully the fan isn't going to be a problem. It seems to be quite quiet at the moment. I can't see it peaking on the meters over there. So that was the Harim conspiracy. It sort of almost went possibly like that. That's my take on it. In fact, I think current feelings are that Barrow actually did survive an assassination attempt and but was done over another time. But who knows? We may never know. Those court details were dug up by sheer chance, just one piece of text that documents that historical event and they certainly wanted it forgotten so how are we going next one oh okay righty ho we've we've done reasonable so this next one it's from the instructions of Aminope and the, the inspiration for this line inspiration for this story was a line that goes do not gossip in your neighborhood because people respect the silence. So, um, yeah, I quite, it's quite fun, this one. I like this one. Another hot and hard day. Baba was fed up. He was fed up of all the hard work. He was also really fed up with this huge sack that he was lugging across the village again. One of many he had to do today. He was also fed up with everybody's reactions to him. They all gave him very unpleasant looks. Okay, he's got to admit that he has upset a few people recently. Yes, the, there was a mistake over some possibly stolen tools, but they weren't really stolen. And he apologised profusely about that mistake and misunderstanding. And there were others, but, you know, people should just live and forget these things. You know, we always make mistakes. And, you know... <laughs> I just happened to hear these things, Baba says to himself. He approaches the market square again. 
which how many he's lost count of how many of these sacks he's moved i've moved today i don't know he is then spun slightly by someone pushing past him he turns and glares in the face of somebody he's familiar with but he couldn't quite place it this time Baba, you've done really bad. That mis misunderstanding with my donkey has cost me a whole month's worth of possible work. You need to keep your mouth shut. Baba nods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I will, I will, I promise and staggers further on. Oh, these people. Why can't I be an artisan instead of everybody's donkey? Okay, I you know my fingers are chunky and I'm not nimble or dexterous and but I have to have a better life than carrying things for everybody. He staggers across the market square, trying to avoid everybody's gazes, which isn't hard because everyone is trying to avoid him. But this sack is really heavy and he's tiring. He'll be so glad to have finished this delivery. Hopefully his boss will then forgive him from that other misunderstanding a couple of days ago. It was another innocent mistake. Got too many people involved. But no, this sack is just too uncomfortable. He reaches the edge of the market and just drops it down. So I need a bit of a a break. It's getting too warm for doing this. And he slinks and slides down the wall next to one of the market stalls that has no customer, so he's not bothering anyone. Trying to get his breath back and the enthusiasm to continue, his ears prick up. Voices. They seem to be having an argument. Hmm. This is interesting. I wonder what the argument's about. So he peeks around the corner of the stall. He sees two, two men on the other side of it, deep in conversation. Well, one's actually grabbing the, the front of the other guy's tunic. Oh, okay, so that is Osiris R. Why is he almost being throttled by the other guy? Not sure I know him. Ah, it's Heru. Interesting. What are they talking about? So he creeps under the stool and sees if he can get a better, better hear of what they do up to. He makes out Cyrus R's voice. Haru, I've told you, I will sort out that amulet for you later. Can't we just wait until this burial is over? Mm, interesting, Baba thinks. Cyrus R. I want that amulet. I need it for another burial. And I've paid you for this. Baba makes out some shuffling. Interesting, interesting things, Baba. Wonder what's going on here. I wonder. Is Cyrus R robbing the dead? 
it would be a good opportunity. He's the embalmer. Whatever amulets, and gold and precious things are put on the body when he wraps them, you can easily take away. And once it's all sealed, no one will ever know. Interesting. That's very bad to rob the dead. I think I really should talk to the magistrate about this. Because how long has he been doing this? I think I better go and do that now before I forget. And Baba crawls out rapidly from underneath the, the stall and hurtles around the corner, forgetting his delivery and hurtling out of the town towards the judge's house. His little sandals flip flapping, bringing up dust as he ran. A group of men, one happened to be his boss, and Baba noticed that as he was approaching rapidly without the sack on his back, heard the voice of his boss shouting, where are you going, Baba? And Baba waved. Later, beta. Osiris R is robbing the dead. I have to go talk to the judge now. He shouts over his shoulder as he continues nonstop towards the judge's house. The dust cloud settles amongst these group of men. They drop their little their game of dice and look at one another. Did I just get that right? Says one of them. Did Baba just say Osiris R, the embalmer? a very respectable man is robbing the dead. They all nod in agreement. Now we know what Baba's like, but you know, I buried my cousin last week and I spent quite a lot of goods to get him buried. Some family heirlooms went in that in that tomb. I think we need to ask some questions here. He reaches down and picks up one of his rakes. Well, come on, lads. Why don't we go and visit Osiris R and find out? And they all grab various farm implements and head back into the village, intent on seeking an answer from Osiris R. Baba eventually meets, reaches the magistrate's house and bangs on the door. A servant brings the magistrate, who groans at the sight of Baba, breathless, rapiding on about dead, robbery, and all sorts of strange things and accusations. Let's out a sigh. Let us go and have a look, shall we, Baba? And the magistrate takes a leisurely walk into town. He approaches Osiris R's place of business, who happens to be his home as well, and to a baying crowd standing outside the house, throwing rocks at the doors and the wall. Baba is on the heels of the magistrate. 
as the magistrate approaches, everybody turns silent and stands away from the door. No one wants to meet his gaze. What is going on here? The magistrate focuses on every single person that stands there. A voice at the back shouts, Osiris R is robbing the dead. And then everybody starts shouting and hollering and waving things and throwing things again. But the magistrate calms everybody down. What proof do you have of this? Everybody points at Baba, who looks very embarrassed. The magistrate turns to Baba. I think, Baba, you'd better go home. We will talk about this later. Now I need to talk to Osiris R. He approaches the door and it opens a crack at his approach. He, he recognises the pale and frightened face of Osiris R peeking out as the door is opened and the magistrate enters. Well, all this excitement's over now. Baba feels, yeah, perhaps it's time I now sort of go home, as the judge suggests. I hope I've not made a mistake again this time. I really hope that. This is quite a serious one. But they were definitely arguing over something. There was definitely something wrong there. He creeps home and relaxes with something to drink and eat. It's been a very strenuous day. His tiredness overcomes him and he drifts off to sleep. Baba wakes. It's dark, very dark. Very, the air is very strange and I'm lying down. Why am I lying down? I was in my chair when I thought I fell asleep. And he goes to move and bangs his head. What is this? He's in a box. He can feel it all around him. There's, 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 a, there's a lid there. He's lying on his back. And there's a box. This is above feet. What am I doing in a box? Starts banging. Why am I in this box? Let me out. He hears some muffled shouting. And then there's a torrent of noise on the box. Something is thumping. Lots of things are thumping the box and then silence. Is that someone out there? And he waits. Let me out, let me out of this box. Why am I in this box? He hears then a voice, a muffled voice from outside. Baba, you have been really naughty this time. You almost cost me my life. If the judge hadn't arrived, I'm sure that rabble would have killed me. Oh, oh, is that a Cyrus R? I'm really sorry. Really sorry. 
I hope it wasn't a total misunderstanding. It must have been. I'm really sorry this time. I'll be better next time. There won't be a next time, Baba. We have all decided we have had enough of you. Your gossiping has caused so many problems. And this time it almost cost somebody their life. We've decided to do something. So tough. The box is then thrown around and Bava feels himself being moved around with inside this box. He starts banging, let me out, let me out, let me out. No one's paying him attention. He doesn't know where he is. The box that he is in seems to be being dragged somewhere. And then there's silence. Some weeks later, a shepherd running his flock through the village to the market encounters a group of artisans on the edge of town. They're constructing something of, of, of uh, mud brick. They seem to be quite intent on this. You there, what is this being constructed? It's Osiris R. Looks up from the papyrus with a sketch that he's been observing, examining and waves and greets the shepherd. Well, my dear friend, this is a new shrine to a great sage of the village. For many years now, this sage has listened to all our worries. And now he is dead. We are instructing this shrine to him so that we may, anyone who needs some, to give up some words in confidence can do so at this shrine and it never be repeated again. Go. Ah, righty ho, we have one more to go. How are we doing? Oh, might we might we're gonna scrape this one in for an hour and a half, aren't we? Ah, it is warm down here in Dover. It is a warm day. Right. Oh, yes, I like this one. This one's interesting again. Right. So again, this one is from, I'm not sure, I think it's the uh, uh, instructions of Animo. All conduct should be so straight that you can measure it with a plumb line. In the dark temple of Amun Ra, Raheb stands before the golden shrine and the golden statue of his lord, Amun Ra. Blessed are we, and may you give me strength in everything that I do. He steps back and closes the shrine doors. Carefully, he retreats from the sacred naos and the home of his god. With the door sealed shut, that is the observances over with for the day. He can now relax. 
or not for one of his priests rapidly is running towards him looking very irritated something's wrong and he awaits whatever this bad news happens to be breathlessly the priest announces that the patron Tia is awaiting him in his study. Raheb sighs. Okay. And slowly approaches his dwellings within the temple. Entering his personal study, the scent of Tia fills the room. She sits meekly upon one of the stalls in the barren room, dripping with gold and luxurious clothes that are almost transparent. He stifles a gasp at her beauty. Then he realizes she's been talking and he snaps out of it. I'm sorry, my lady. Sorry for that noise out there. That's thrown me now. <laughs> May not have come up on the uh, microphone, but there was a bit of shouting going on. Tia, you may be patron of this temple, and I appreciate all that you give us, but you have no right to interrupt my rituals just so I can entertain you because you are bored. Her eyes go tight. She glares at him. He stops. I'm sorry. Apologies for that outburst. It's been a very long day. How may I help you, your lady? Her cold stare turns into a broad grin. Well, she purrs. My husband, Nebenti, is with Pharaoh right now, planning the forthcoming campaigns against the people of the North. And I admit, I am bored. And so I came to see you to fill in some time. But also to tell you that this elevated social status I now have, now my husband is vizier to Pharaoh, has given me somewhat more freedom and time to do what I will. Unfortunately, he is always busy with Pharaoh. So I'm coming to see you, just for some companionship. But don't worry, I will bring more than that. With the blessings of Pharaoh, I will be in more position to help the temple. I can give more contributions to your treasury. And perhaps to you personally. Raheb nods. Thank you, your ladyship. She stands and takes a step closer to him. She touches his arm.
Do you get what I am saying, Rahab? Rahab swallows hard. I do, Tia, but you must remember I am a priest of this temple. I have certain obligations and certain constraints upon myself. And of course, you are Rahab's Nevente's wife. She pushes herself away from him. My husband is a busy man. Like you, he has his commitments that he is devoted to. But I have needs and he does not give them all. Come, I will show you what I will give you. And taking his arm leads him to his small barren bed. The hubbub of temple wakes Rahab. He looks up to see Tia getting dressed, ready to go. Going so soon, he stretches out on his bed, realizing actually he should be getting up because he has the temple to run. Tia looks down at Rahab and smoothing her flawless clothing. My husband will be home from Pharaoh by now and will probably be wondering where I am. But do not worry, I shall be back another time to show you some more things I can give you and the temple. But in the meantime, take this trinket and she removes a serpent ring from her hand and throws it onto the bed next to Rahab. And she suddenly departs, leaving a wafting of her exquisite perfume to fill the room. Raneb lays back and sighs at the wonders of last night. Later in the day, performing yet one of the other rituals for his god Amun Ra, he close, begins to close the temple. There is noise behind him disrupting his ritual. He throws a glance over his shoulder. Only the pure are allowed to be within this sacred space. Depart before you abase yourself. The movement stops as Rahab continues reversing out, but the voice reply sounds familiar. Pure, eh? Well then, what are you doing in here, Rahab? Rahab stops, he freezes. The voice is now recognizable. It's Neheb T, Tia's husband. He quickly finishes off the ritual and retreats, closing the shrine door to fully face a very angry looking man. Nihebti steps very close, face up tight. Have you seen my wife recently? 
knee heb, steps back. Not until la not since last night when she visited the temple. And he begins to turn away to return back to his next set of duties. But he's swung around by Nepti. That's a lie. She was here with you last night. She came home this morning. And look, I see she left her branding. And he points at the serpent ring on Neheb's hand. Now listen to me, Neheb. Raheb, even. <gasps> All these names. I understand my wife has needs. And she has more freedom than she has had before for her new status. And I understand I cannot provide everything for her because I am busy with Pharaoh. So I do not have any problem with any encounters she may have with other people. Except for some, and that one and only actually is you. There are rumours and no hiding in this temple to escape those rumours will make you safe. If I see her with you again, if you ever touch her again, I will kill you. Neventi sudden turns and hurtles towards the gate. Raheb realizes he was holding his breath and lets out the air. Oh, it was close. And a little shaken, looks around to make sure he was not overheard by any of the others, priests within the temple. He straightens himself and stalks back to his study to think. Later that night, Raheb and Tia are in bed. Tia, Raheb says, while stroking her arm, I think we need to stop seeing us, seeing each other. It's too dangerous. I had a visit from your husband. She laughs and lays back, stroking his chest. Don't let him put you off. I know he's concerned about these rumours that I have heard about you, Raheb. The rumours don't concern me. But are they true? Raheb shakes his head. I do not know what you're talking about. Oh, you do know what I'm talking about. The accusations of seducing rich women and stealing all of their jewels, gold and wealth for your own means. That is why you're hiding here, isn't it? That's why you have managed to convince Pharaoh to make you high priest at this temple, to show that you are actually innocent of all of these. But don't, that has no, I do not care about those accusations. I can look after myself. Raheb sighs. Just so you are aware. Thank you. And they kiss. 
the days go by and the nights go by in many ways. It is some weeks that pass and Raheb and Tia are in bed once again. There has been no further accusations, no further arguments with Nebenti. But Raheb is anxious. Tia, I think someone is watching me. Someone is definitely watching me in the temple. I can feel it. I know it's something is bad is going to happen. She brushes him away and strokes him again. It's just your imagination, Raheb. My husband does not care. He just did, uh, just cornered you to shake you up. They begin to hug and kiss again. And then there's a disturbance outside causes them to freeze. They listen intently. I hear priests shouting, he is not to be disturbed. And the reply, oh, I know what he's up to. Have no fear of that. That's the definitely voice of Neb and T. They both look at one another and Raheb hurriedly climbs off the bed and pulling on a spare sheet wraps it around him and heads to the door. Tia just lies there on the bed, watching the door, listening to anxious voices and arguments that are growing in volume outside beyond her sight. Raheb returns, closely followed by Nebenti into the room. Nebenti glares at the naked wife in Raheb's bed, who's not even attempted to covering herself. His face dark and brooding. Raheb gestures to a stool and opposite a table. I am sure, Nebenti, we can discuss this like adults. Why don't I just get us some beer and we can talk? He goes to the side and pulls out a jug of beer from a niche and two gut mugs. He also notices a small vial in one of the other nearby niches. He quickly flourishes the cups while his other hand quickly makes a grab for this vial and puts it in his uh, belt. Picking up the jug, he then returns and sits opposite Nebenti at the table, plonking the jug down and the two cups. Let us talk about this, he repeats. Nebenti glares at Raheb, stands up and then walks towards his wife. Looks down at her 
on the bed. Again, still not even attempting to cover herself up. You, he points at his wife. I have told you not to see him and you have disobeyed. It's only the only person I do not want you to see. I do not care who else you spend nights with, but not him. While diverted, Raheb retrieves the vial and pours it into the jug, swishes the jug around to make sure the contents are well mixed. Come back, Nebenti, Raheb says. Look, let us have a drink and talk about this. Nebenti returns and sits down and Raheb pours the beer into both of the cups. They both pick up and Raheb watches carefully as Nebenti swirls it around and looks at the pair of them individually. He puts it down much to the disappointment of Raheb. This is not going to happen to me. You are not going to rob me of my wealth and status. I will not be disgraced. All these lies, all these accusations against you are true, aren't they? You are not innocent, Raheb. Raheb begins to demonstrate and try to defend his honour, but he stops as he sees Nebenti pull a knife from his belt. Time for this to be dealt with another way. And Nebenti steps up and points the knife at Raheb. I am going to do what other husbands should have done to you long ago. Raheb st staggers back, climbs off the chair, and takes a step back. He cannot this is he's a, he cannot defend himself he's unarmed please nebenti let us talk about this properly tia now seeing what her husband's just about to commit murder tries to defend neben raheb Wrapping the sheet around her, she climbs off the bed and falls at her husband's feet. And please do not, do not do this. Please listen. Nebenti looks at his wife, pleading with him at his feet. His other hand, he reaches for the jug of beer and swings it across her face it hits her head and she falls unconscious to the floor i'll deal with you later wife he approaches raheb who backs further and further away his legs catch the bottom of the edge of the bed and he falls onto the bed nowhere to run now is there and he closes in and plunges the knife down into the stomach of Raheb. And again, and again. Raheb dies. Nebenti his hand, his fist, bloody, with the knife still in it, looks at what he has done. His flash of anger disappears. 
and he drops the knife. He turns to see his wife slowly coming round. And he kneels down beside her and hugs her dearly. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. She is shaking the concussion from her head. Look, let me give you this. Handy reaches for one of the cups. And takes it to her lips and pours it in. She greedily drinks it. And then she stops. She looks at the cup. She looks up at the table to see there's only one cup left. Fear is in her eyes. Nebenti is confused at what this expression. And then she convulses. She shakes, confused. He holds, totally unsure of what to do. Her mouth foams and she gasps and is then still. It then dawns on him what has just happened. He begins to tremble. He lays his dead wife to the floor and looks at the bloody body on the bed. I have only ever tried to do what's right. I have always been innocent of this. But how can I go on now? I have killed two people. I must do what is right. And he looks at the dagger and at the other cup. Yes, I must do what is right. And he reaches for the other cup. Thank you. Well, I hope, how long have we done? Oh, I think uh, we've done that. I think we've done all right. So thank you. The, um, this is part of the Free Fringe. So if you want to make any donations to the Free Fringe, the links are in the chat and will be on the description when I post this up to YouTube. So feel free to, if you enjoyed this, to contribute to the Free Fringe. Uh, also to myself, if you want, if that's fine. That would be lovely. Now, there's lots of other fantastic shows in virtual and physically. So if you're in Edinburgh for the rest of the month, go visit them. They look awesome. I wish I could be there this year, but I can't. So next year, hopefully I'll be taking some of these shows to in person in Edinburgh next year. Um, if not, if you want to see some more of me, I've got a few more shows. I've got another one on Tuesday and I've got a few more through the rest of the month. So do sign up and thanks for coming along. Thank you. Night night.